On this week's 51%, we sit down with attorney Megan harris Piero to broach the uncomfortable subject of estate planning and learn why it's particularly important for women. Just as it's important for women to feel like they understand their financial health, it can be kind of shocking when a partner passes away to look at just your finances as an individual. And I think that's something that estate planning can help women prepare for. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. Today we're discussing a topic that I'm guessing many of us avoid thinking about in our day-to-day lives. Basically, what happens when we die? And I'm not talking in the literal or philosophical sense, but what happens to our loved ones, to the things we leave behind once we're gone? During our lifetimes, even, what happens when we become incapable of making our own decisions? Estate attorney Megan harris Puro is an expert on that, and she's been helping women with end-of-life planning for more than a decade. She says estate planning is particularly important for women, for many of the same reasons that we've also held conversations about retirement planning, investing, and financial literacy on this show. First and foremost, women on average live longer than men. It's also important to recognize that estate planning covers a lot more than just who gets your stuff. There are things you should be keeping in mind, even if you're young, broke, and in good health. So we're going to go over all of this today. Before we start, a note that Harris Pirro deals with New York state law. And so while her general advice is good for everyone, she strongly recommends that you check in with an estate attorney yourself and consider the laws in your specific state. To tell you a little bit more about our guest, Harris Pirro is a graduate of Duke University and Duquesne Law School. She launched the Harris Pirro Law Firm in Saratoga Springs in 2015 and was named a Saratoga Woman of Influence in 2019. Harris Pirro also serves on the board of the Agricultural Stewardship Association, which protects open space and farmland in Washington and Rensselaer counties. She says she initially wanted to go into environmental law, but she found that she could have a more personal impact on her clients' lives by helping them with their estates. It really spoke to me to make people feel more planned and prepared in their lives for emergency situations and for just the stuff that families go through. When I was 10 years old, my older sister, who at the time was 16, she had a car accident that ended up, um, she had a traumatic brain injury from it. And just seeing kind of the disruption in my family from that occurring, I can see why and how I gravitated into estate planning and helping people be prepared for their lives and anything that comes up. So at what age should we be thinking about all of this stuff? You know, as you mentioned, your sister was only 16 at the time of her car accident. You know, I still feel like I'm pretty young. I haven't thought about any of it, to be honest. You know, at what point should someone start thinking about a will? Yeah, so estate planning is really an important thing for anyone to think about over the age of 18. And I think one of the challenges with estate planning is that most people think of it just as a will. An 18-year-old may not need a will, but they should have a health care proxy, what's called a living will, and a power of attorney. Um, and then for 16-year-olds or uh, you know other minors, they won't have an estate plan themselves, but it's important that their families have them in place. So like in the case of my sister, when you have a child with disability, then 
parents need to think about a different kind of planning to make sure that their child is taken care of both financially and for um, decision making that adults with disabilities might need help with. We've done previous episodes on this show about like financial literacy, investing, the sort of planning for your later years in general, and, and why that's so important for women. Women are, of course, statistically more likely to outlive their partners if they're married to a man. So, you know, just tell me a little more about the benefits of having an estate plan, especially for women. Sure, yeah. The National Institutes of Health um, state that women live on average five years longer than men. And we can see that in our estate planning practice sometimes. Um, well, you have widows, both female and male. But I think that just as it's important for women to feel like they understand their financial health while they're alive, it can be kind of shocking when a partner passes away to look at just your finances as an individual. And I think that's something that estate planning can help women prepare for is what is the financial picture going to look like when a partner passes away, especially if you've been kind of reliant on that partner or the partner's pension or something like that. Okay, so you've touched on some of the different parts of an estate plan, but let's go a little bit more in depth. You know, you've got your will, your living will, healthcare proxy, and I think that last one was power of attorney. What goes into each of those? A healthcare proxy allows you to name healthcare agents to make healthcare decisions for you in the event that you can't. So if you were in the hospital in a coma, for example, and can't articulate what your wishes are for something, your healthcare agents are going to make that decision. And it's really important for, for anyone over 18 to have that healthcare proxy because it empowers you to decide who those agents should be and in what order. So in, in New York state, those agents are in an order. So if they had to make the most serious decision about your life, which is whether to take you off machines or not in the event that you're in a terminal condition, it seems to me at least, you know, important that you be able to dictate who is the right person to make that decision. And it's a kind of a priority ranking. You know, agents can speak with one another and families, of course, they can talk with each other. But being able to decide that ranking of who your people are for your healthcare decisions is very really empowering. Um, and then the living will is your instructions for the end of your life. It's those instructions that you leave for your healthcare agents if they do end up in the circumstance where they have to make that decision of taking you off machines or not. Last will and testament that people call about and say, I need a will, that's about who gets your stuff. But the living will is instructions for the end of your life. And power of attorney? Uh, for a power of attorney, you are naming agents to help you with non-medical items during your lifetime. It's only good during your lifetime. And you want to give your agent broad powers because having a power of attorney can help avoid the need for a guardian being appointed for you during, during your lifetime if you um, suffer from a coma or incapacity or something like that. So really hot in the news is Britney Spears' conservatorship and the end of all of that. In New York, we don't have conservators. We have guardians. And you can have a guardian over you as an adult. So anyone over 18 should have a power of attorney. What's the difference between a conservator and a guardian? It's just a name thing. In New York, the term is guardian. In other states, it might be conservator. And so if someone wants to set all of this up, where do they start? Is this something someone can only make official through an attorney like you, or can people do it on their own? An estate planning attorney will have you fill out a questionnaire as your initial step for estate planning. It's very important for the estate planning attorney to know about your goals um, and to know about your family um, and your assets. Family is important to know the dynamics. Is this a second marriage? Are you not married, but treating a partner 
or wanting to treat a partner as if you are married? Do you have children? Are they separate children? All those things can impact the plan that that is put together for you. And then for assets, the estate planning attorney might want to consider um, whether you have enough to take care of your own long-term care needs or whether you might need Medicaid in the future and how to set you up for success in applying for Medicaid in the future. And then for um, wealthy families, which I would say is over $6 million that the, the couple might have together, an estate planning attorney would also talk to you about potential estate tax. I guess we haven't touched on trusts yet. Uh, tell me a little bit more about like what a trust is and why might someone choose to establish a trust rather than give away their assets directly in a will? So most people, when they, when they call about estate planning, they ask for a will. And that's the most most common vehicle that we think about for our assets and where they should go. Um, wills, when they're written, they're really just instructions for what you want to have happen when you pass away, but they don't have an effect until they go through the court. And that's why it's your last will that's the important one, your last will and testament. So your last will and testament, when you pass away, it gets filed with the court and that proceeding is called probate. Some people wanna avoid probate because um, there are filing fees with the court, depending on where you live, it could take a long time to get through surrogate's court, which is the court that processes wills for probate. And so that can be one reason why people might want a trust instead of a will, just to avoid probate. Some people also want privacy and don't want um, others to be able to go down to the courthouse and look at their will and kind of get that picture into their lives about what they own. So that can be another reason. Um, so cost savings, privacy, and also if you have a complicated family situation, if you go through probate, your immediate family has to get notified. So if you have a child, for example, that you are estranged from and you're not in communication with anymore, um, they will have to receive a notice about your will going through probate, even if they're not receiving anything. So for those um, individuals who have close family members that are not in contact with or who don't know any of their close family members, using a trust can be a really great thing. And what are the different kinds of trusts out there? Because I've seen a lot of different names when I've Googled them on the internet. You know, how do you know which one is right for you? Trusts come in two main types, revocable and irrevocable. And a revocable trust, I like to call, it's like an alter ego. It's like <laughs> you with a cape. Like you are creating a contract when you have a revocable trust about how you want your assets to be treated during your life and after you pass away. And that revocable trust, you can put things in and out of it. You can pay your bills from it. You can have, you want to have some accounts in the name of the revocable trust holding assets in it. And its superpower is that it helps you avoid probate. So that's what a revocable trust can do for you. If you have estate tax planning issues, a lot of times for couples will set up two revocable trusts and use that as part of their plan too. But it doesn't have to be only for estate tax issues. Again, you might want privacy for your family. You might want an easier settlement meaning people getting their money easier and quicker. Also, if you own a business, a revocable trust in conjunction with your, your business documents can kind of help keep your business rolling um, quicker and easier than if you were relying on a will. Then we've got irrevocable trusts. So irrevocable trusts can't be changed, right? It sounds like it can't be changed. They're irrevocable. 
generally speaking, you can't change an irrevocable trust, but there are some allowances and things, at least in New York law, where, where you can change certain things, you can draft certain ways. But irrevocable trusts are generally used either to set aside assets um, apart from your estate to reduce your estate tax liability, or I think more commonly for most people to protect assets from future long-term care costs. Estate planning attorneys use all different words for these trusts. So you'll, if you look online about trusts, you will see things about SLATs, they're called sp spousal lifetime asset trusts. You'll see Medicaid asset protection trusts, special needs trusts, um, which can help a disabled individual continue to get government benefits, but you can still leave them money or give them money for other things. So all these different kinds of trusts, though, are basically different varieties of either revocable or irrevocable trusts. Of course, you practice law in New York, so we should probably have a little bit of a disclaimer here that we're talking about New York's laws and, you know, things might be different from state to state. Um, but what happens here in New York if you don't do any of this, if you don't have an estate plan and you pass away without one? So every state has its own laws for um, kind of the default plan that is your estate plan if you don't make a plan yourself. So in New York, if you're married with children and your spouse passes away without a, a will or a trust to dictate where their assets go, then you as the surviving spouse or the widow, you get the first $50,000 of your spouse's assets those assets that are just in their name, plus half of the rest. And then your children get the other half of the assets. And that, for most people, is shocking. Because I think people assume that if you're married, you know, everything everything I own goes to my spouse. And that should be the, the default. At least that's what people typically want. But that is not the standard New York plan. And if you're not married? If you're not married, your assets go to your children if you have them. If you don't have children, then it goes to your parents. And then there's kind of uh, falls further through the family tree after that. So how often would you say we should revisit all of this? Because obviously, I think, you know, if you set one up early, your life's going to look drastically different if you go on to live a full and happy life. Um, so when is it a good time to look over things and, and make updates? I think it's important to revisit your plan every time you have a big life change. So estate planning for an 18-year-old is going to look different than estate planning for someone um, who is in their 20s and maybe starting their own business or just got married. And that's going to look different when you have a child. And again, look different in the future when you're preparing for retirement or when you're in retirement and you have a partner with a health issue. So all of those milestones would be important times to check in with your estate planning attorney, maybe look over your documents and figure out if they're still right for you. All right. Well, Megan, thanks so much for coming on. Any last advice or I guess even like common mistakes that you see people making? I think it's important to look for an estate planning attorney to be an advisor and to think of them as, as someone who's going to help you diagnose your goals, the issues you maybe didn't know you had, and help suggest and recommend things for you. I think a lot of people come in and they have already put beneficiaries on every account and they say, we're all good to go because uh, if you put beneficiaries on accounts, you can avoid probate for those accounts. And then sometimes we dig deeper into the issues and maybe there is 
a grandchild who is a beneficiary who really shouldn't be receiving money directly. And we might talk about setting up a trust for that grandchild and making sure the money goes to the trust instead of directly to the grandchild on the beneficiary designation. And I think that in wills and trusts, you can set up what I like to call safety nets for holding money for beneficiaries for different things that come up in their lives. So your beneficiary is just whoever you're leaving things to. In my family, my sister had a car accident at 16. Nobody could have predicted that. I can't, I also can't predict if my client's child is going to have a car accident or a drug problem or something like that. And I think estate planning attorneys who are comprehensive can help protect your family from those events and try to help make your family's wealth last longer so that when you pass away, if your money goes to someone who at that time just had an accident or or recently has a drug issue and needs to go through rehab or something like that, a trust or a will can set up strategies to deal with those issues. And I think people rely too much on beneficiary designations. And then I think I would just disclaim that the advice that I'm giving today is very, is general legal advice. And I advise that anyone considering estate planning consults an attorney. I've also seen a trend as we rely more and more on the internet. I've seen a trend of people trying to do their estate planning online from websites. I think that everyone should consider that the plan is not just some pieces of paper describing where things go, but it should be a document that is useful to the people that you're leaving things to and is useful to whoever is carrying out your wishes. And I think when you have a relationship with an estate planning attorney, you have a relationship where someone might be able to come to your hospital bed and help you make a change, or someone can personally help your loved ones through the process. And that's something that I don't think internet services or, you know, the AI robots are ever going to provide for people. Megan harris Piro is an estate attorney with harris Piro Law Firm in Saratoga Springs, New York, which specializes in estate, elder, and business law. To learn more about her work, you can check out the firm's website at saratogawills.com. There you can also find in-depth guides, worksheets, and emergency planning checklists to help you figure out where to start. Megan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. One quick story before we go. For years, Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, has been collecting the personal papers and correspondence of the renowned 20th century poet Elizabeth Bishop. Bishop died in 1979, but her work still fascinates readers and researchers today. Ronald Patkus, historian and head of special collections at Vassar, says Elizabeth Bishop's papers has become one of the college's most valuable and popular collections to date, and they're still finding new ways to look at it. A new exhibit at the college's Thompson Library, for example, showcases tables and tables of Bishop's postcards, from your standard scenic photographs to kitschy tokens and handmade collages. Patkus says Bishop had an extensive postcard collection, but it's never really been studied until now. The postcards for many years were ignored, probably precisely because they were postcards. But now, scholar, you know, scholars are taking newer interest in material culture, and as it turns out, in our collection, we have over 500 examples of postcards. We think there are probably more out there in the world today, but that's, that's a great part of our archive that hasn't really been explored. Patkiss credits guest curators Dr. Jonathan Ellis from the University of Sheffield and Susan Rosenbaum from the University of Georgia for the idea. Together, the three poured over Vassar's collection and singled out 55 jewels spanning from her early life to her final years. Patkiss says they're pretty fragile and they couldn't have guests handling and flipping over the cards themselves, so they had to get creative. We usually will put the uh, front of the picture with the original, but we had uh, facsimiles made of the back. Mm. But they came out really well, I think. 
Bishop studied English at Vassar and graduated in 1934, hence the college's determination to collect her work. Born in 1911, Patkiss says she had a turbulent childhood. Her father died less than a year after her birth, and Bishop's mother was institutionalized in 1916. However, Bishop went on to make a wide circle of friends, including some of her classmates at Vassar, like Franny Blau Muser. Patkiss says Muser was a frequent recipient of Bishop's postcards, as were other famous artists and poets at the time, like Lauren McIver and James Merrill. The postcard as a format was very popular sort of in the early and middle 20th century. Late late century too, but, but especially middle. And there were like literally millions of them that were sent around the world. But especially looking at Bishop, we can see therefore how she used the postcard in her life. Um, and that's some of the, the things that the, uh, that the curators tried to bring out. Bishop's inheritance from her father gave her the ability to travel extensively over the course of her life. On display at the Vassar exhibit are postcards from Rome, Paris, Key West, Boston, and particularly Brazil, where Bishop lived for 15 years after developing a relationship with the architect Lota de Macedo Suarez. Pekka says there's a few cards that were clearly her favorites. He says Bishop had multiple copies of a bright red cartoonish postcard reading You Don't Know Beans Until You've Been to Boston in big letters across the front. He suspects the cards were both an outlet for Bishop's sense of humor and her creativity. One section of the exhibit called X Marks the Spot showcases how Bishop would draw on or notate her postcards to demonstrate her own ties to a site. For example, on the back of an unsent postcard from Great Village in Nova Scotia, where Bishop spent her early childhood, she notes, quote, I drove the cow to pasture up this road, end quote. Another card delivered to her doctor, Annie Bowman, features a painting of the Library of Congress, with a small X in the upper left-hand corner, marking the office where Bishop served as a consultant in poetry in 1949. Packus says Bishop even dabbled in making her own cards from scratch. In one postcard, Bishop and a friend stick their heads through a cardboard cutout, posing as boxers. This is Bishop on the right. One thing I find in looking at this exhibit is, um, you know, it's very visual. Mm -hmm. You know, it it pulls you in just to see all the different images. But then there's also real interesting things happening in the texts as well. Um, You know, certain aspects of her life or things that she was thinking about. Mm -hmm. So both things are really are kind of important. In all, the Vassar exhibit contains 12 categories of postcards for visitors to dig through. Bishop's poems and short stories would go on to win nearly every literary honor and prize in the United States, including a Pulitzer. That said, she wasn't a particularly prolific writer, publishing only a handful of books in her lifetime. And unlike some of her contemporaries, like Robert Lowell, Bishop didn't incorporate many intimate details from her life into her work. Packa says that's part of why Bishop's correspondence is so important and fascinating. It gives scholars a glimpse into her personal life. He hopes the exhibit will bring additional cards and letters out of the woodwork because the demand for Bishop's papers is on the rise. There's been just a a real interest in her work and it has not, uh, you know, it's grown and it seems, you know, almost every year there's, you know, books, articles uh, coming out, conferences have been held, entire conferences devoting to devoted to Elizabeth Bishop. There's just a number of scholars who are very interested in, in, you know, in her oeuvre. Elizabeth Bishop's postcards will remain on view at the Thompson Library through the fall semester. By way of disclosure, Vassar College is home to WAMC's Hudson Valley Bureau. You've been listening to 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at wamcpodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC's shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at wamc.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King, 51%.